This is the last step and I want to do two things. I want to complete the story of what might be called classical Keynesian economics. And if you think about it, uh, I, I try to lay out the, the elements that are distinguishing it from, or, from traditional Keynesian economics as it's been received by interpreters of Keynes. Uh, because as you know, Keynes left his work in a highly uh, unfinished manner. Not as unfinished as Marx, I must say. I, he finished one book and he was planning to come back and do more, but they had the similar characteristic that there are many ambiguities and aspects of the argument which uh, even the most fervent Keynesians admit are confusing and unclear. But I want to focus on certain ones. First is the argument that uh, investment is motivated by the marginal efficiency of uh, investment, marginal efficiency of capital, which is really the rate of return on investment. And Keynes and Marx are similar in this respect. They both say that uh, investment depends on the rate of return uh, on investment net of the interest rate. Right, so we did that last time. It's the net rate of expected net rate of return. And the reason for that is clear. If you're not making more than if you can put it in the bank, then there's no point in investing at all. On the other hand, if you're making more here than there, then you move it over there more rapidly. So that's the first element, and I, I meant the point that the difference here between Marx and Keynes is that Keynes tends to view this as a level because he operates in the short run in a static framework that is not a growing trend, and for Marx that's inconceivable because the essence of capitalism is growth. Capital is self-expanding value, same thing with Ricardo, Smith. The thing about capitalism is that it grows, and that's why I tried to show you that data in the beginning to show you that this is not something that they were inventing. This is the signature, the genetic signature of capitalism, that where it's successful, it grows. Then the second thing is that uh, I argued that it's logically necessary in Marx or in the classical tradition, because Marx doesn't actually say this very clearly, um, that the interest rate be regulated by profitability because banks are simply profit making enterprises and their competition among banks and between banks and other uses of capital will make the rate of return equal and the rate of return is equalized through the price of the commodity. I mean if your corn price is high here and the steel price is uh, low here meaning high meaning there's a high profit rate there and here it's low then as capital flows more slowly into here, the supply falls relative to demand and the price rises and the opposite here, it flows more rapidly, supply rises relative to demand, the price comes down. So the equalization of profit rates takes place through prices. Well, what's the price of finance? It's the interest rate. So that there you have the logical necessity of the equalization of, uh, of a price uh, interest rate determined by uh, capital mobility and competition. Now Marx is peculiar in the following sense that there are many bits and pieces where Marx says different things. For instance, he tries, he says he doesn't believe in a natural rate of interest. But when you think of what you mean by the natural rate of interest, it means an interest rate which is not dependent on other factors. And I tried to show you that the logical consequence of assuming that the interest rate is in fact regulated by profitability is that what that means is that the price of finance uh, is equal to, we'll do it the other way, the price of finance is equal to the cost of finance per unit output, and the output of finance is loans, so cost per unit loans, plus the profit rate on the capital per unit loans. Capital includes plant, equipment, and reserves, very important for banks. You can measure these. And that means that since these cost and capital terms are in uh, measures are in dollars, as they are for any commodity, uh, you can break them down into the real component and the price component. And that tells you that really the interest rate will follow the price level insofar as the cost of bankings follow the price level, which is a general proposition. If you have inflation, costs go up in general. So you'd expect the interest rate to, to follow uh, the price level. Now as I mentioned, this particular aspect is known, is well known empirically. Discovered by Took, Thomas Took, uh, 
uh, and then rediscovered by Gibson, and it's called Gibson's Paradox because in neoclassical theory, the profit rate, the interest rate should follow the inflation rate, not the price level. But in this argument, you get the inflation rate following the price level, and that's exactly what the inflation rate, uh, the, the interest rate does. And you can look at that. I, I don't, uh, didn't do it here, but it's in that chapter 11. I show all the data, long-term data over hundreds of years, uh, that, that movement, which was well established. Keynes says this is the best known law in empirical law and economics. And yet, when he comes to the interest rate, he has a different explanation, which is that it's based on liquidity preference. And there's a reason why he moves away from the loanable funds and liquidity preference. But my complaint of that, about that is that that doesn't give you a theory of the interest rate. Uh, it gives you, a, a, it doesn't give you an objective theory, it gives you a subjective theory, because it depends on what people feel and so on. But if that were true, if let's say liquidity preference was true, and let's say that liquidity preference made the interest rate higher than, uh, made the bank profits higher than those in other activities. Well, those capital from other activities will be flowing more rapidly into banking. They'll expand the supply of banks, drive the price of banking product down, which is the interest rate, so the interest rate will come back down. So whatever the structure that of preferences and anticipations that in the short and medium run determine the interest rate, they'll be overridden by the equalization of profit rates. Is that point clear? Now the profit rate which is relevant here is the profit rate on new investment. So I measure this, I call this the incremental rate of return, and I measure it broadly speaking by taking the change in profits, uh, gross profits, because uh, data on investment is gross, so change in profits divided by investment. And that, I thought I had invented that, and I discovered when reading Caldor that he would proposed it too. So nothing is ever new, it's been done better before. But uh, that brings me to a point. If this proposition is true, then it also should be true that where there's a rate of return on other assets like the uh, um, stock market, the same mechanism should hold. The stock market should be regulated by profit rate equalization because you can put your money into uh, photocopy shops, you can put them into the stock market. If your preference structure of the stock market causes the rate of return to be higher, then you get arbitrage flows into the stock market. Now, this is an important point because uh, the orthodox theory of the stock market says the stock market is regulated by an underlying rate. And that underlying rate, they say, is the interest rate, the long-term interest rate, which is really uh, measured by time preference. So if you look at the stock market, it moves up and down a lot, the, uh, the rate of return in the stock market. Uh, the time preference, by definition, is uh, human property. Uh, and uh, at least as Schiller measures it, he just takes a straight line, all the way from 1820 or whatever the data goes to the present. And he says, well, okay, I'll adjust the level of the preference, the, the interest rate to be so that it goes through the stock market, so it, it's already making it go through. But all this volatility, the stock market goes up and down, and this is a time preference structure, and it doesn't change very much, so how can you explain that? And Saylor says, this is the unexplained volatility problem which, for which he got the Nobel Prize. And he says it's due to irrational movements and uh, impulses, and he built uh, several books on it. Akerlof, who's also a Nobel laureate, has written about that. So I thought, let me just show you what that looks like. Here is the, this is from, uh, in the book, uh, chapter something. What is it? Uh, figure, uh, figure, figure 10.11 in the book on page 470. And what you're looking at here the dark line is the stock market rate of return as you can measure it from Schiller's data. It's a change in the stock price plus the dividends divided by the stock price. Why is that the rate of return? You pay $100 in, to buy a stock. If the stock goes up $10 then already you've got a return of 10 plus you get a dividend of 2. 
So you get a 12% return on $100. That's your rate of return. That's how it's measured in the stock market. All the business literature, Wall Street Journal, that's how you can see the measure. So here is the stock market rate of return. And this is the volatility that Schiller has trouble explaining. But this dotted line is the uh, incremental rate of return in the corporate sector. And you can see that these two go up remarkably similar rates. And it's not like a straight line through as in Schiller, but a volat and you see the average rate of return in the equity market is 9.83 over the whole post-war period. So I'm not picking my time periods. I'm picking all the data I have. Uh, and the uh, corporate rate is 9.5. And here you see bubbles. This is the famous uh, 1990s bubble. You also see busts here in the great uh, stagflation crisis where the stock market went down very much in real terms. And so here you see the bubble, the bust, and uh, that means that you can actually explain the movements of uh, financial variables by real variables. And that is really the point of competition. Now this is a side argument. I, I want to just bring that up because I won't get to it otherwise. And let me go back to, any questions about this? Uh, so one question someone asked me once, how come you're not rich? And, and that's a very good question. I, try, I thought of that. I mean, naturally, once I saw this data, which was about 10 years ago, here's my problem. The stock market is a predictor of the real rate of return. So I haven't got any way to predict the stock market because to do that, I'd have to predict the real rate of return. The real rate of return is this dotted line, right? But the stock market runs ahead of it, so to speak, a little bit. In annual data, you don't pick that up. In quarterly data, you do. But NIPA, from which I get this real rate of return, publishes it about a year later than today. Because you need the capital stock, you need the profit rate measure. So I'm always a year behind the actual data. And what I need to do is be a year ahead in order to predict the stock market. So if you see me arrive here next time in my private airplane, you know I figure that problem out. But so far it hasn't worked. No, that's not it. That was it. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip over some of the discussion so I can get to the key point. Now, here's one point. You know in the Keynesian multiplier, the multiplier story is that it's static. That is to say, investment is going along at some level and then investment moves up. And I'm showing investment as having fluctuations so that we don't just assume it's just a fixed quantity, but it's going at one level and then it goes up. Then we know from the multiplier story that output will go up more because output is investment over the savings propensity and the effect of a change in investment is a multiplied effect on output. So if you look at it as a time sequence, as a simulation sequence, this is what you would expect to see. Is that clear? This is a multiplier sequence, that's all. And that's what the multiplier sequence should look like in a, from a Keynesian point of view. Then I make the argument that, uh, the third point of my argument, which is that the savings rate cannot be fixed because businesses save uh, in relation to their investment. That is to say, retained earnings is a source of financing for investment. So it would be impossible to argue that the financing for investment is independent of the investment plan. I mean, these are the same people. You sit down in a boardroom and you say, oh, we're planning to expand, and you ask the CFO, well, what do we got to finance for it? And of course, you're one of the sources of finance. And I mentioned the point last night that investment uh, and re retained earnings investment move together very closely, and in <coughs> fact, retained earnings essentially is roughly equal to investment. That's a very important point because it says that most of the finance for business investment in the United States comes from the businesses themselves. Borrowing is expensive, so if you can finance it internally, that's fine. If you, otherwise, you have to borrow, and then you pay it back, and it's interest payments, and so on. So that means that the multiplier is always partially endogenous, because the portion of the multiplier, or the savings rate, which comes from business savings, has to respond to investment. So the whole Keynesian fiction that investment rises 
and the savings rate doesn't change, which is a source of the multiplier, cannot be true. So part of that endogeneity means that if investment rises and the savings rate rises as much, there's no multiplier. If investment rises and savings rate rises somewhat, then the multiplier is damped. Right? So the damping depends on the sensitivity of business savings and household savings to investment. And there are different mechanisms and channels. But I bring that up because when you look in the literature and you say, why do they assume that the savings rate is constant, it turns out it's algebraically convenient. And that's not a hell of a good reason for theory. It really isn't. Kolecki says, for instance, of course business savings is related to investment. But I'm going to assume that savings is determined by aggregate income, which is now business income and personal income, and that's a fixed proportion because, because what? Because it gives a simple story. And the trouble is that's fundamentally a mistake. You can't let algebra determine things like that. Uh, and, and, and it turns out it makes a big difference to the story. So that's a third thing. The fourth thing was that capacity utilization is roughly fluctuates around a normal level. Now I mentioned what the normal level of capacity utilization is the lowest cost point on a cost curve. But the actual cost curve is a curve with many uh, wiggles because different shifts come in and they change the structure of costs and then they go down. For instance, if you go from first shift to second shift, you have to shut your machinery down. That means to start it again, you're starting at a level where you, it's not fully running, so your costs are higher. Moreover, a second shift is often in the evening. Uh, then you have lighting costs that you don't have during the day. You may have heating costs in many countries. Usually you have to pay a premium to get people to work in the second shift, so your cost structure goes up. So it's not surprising that the cost structure of actual firms has got these wiggles due to first, second, third shifts. There are 24 hours in a day, and the cost curve has to encompass the output over all 24 hours. So businesses, a business cost curve, and the one I show in the book is for General Motors, it's got these wiggles. So the lowest point on that curve is the a point where firms would ideally like to operate because that gives them the biggest advantage in the market. So that's the same principle as saying that firms are driven to have lower costs. They're not just driven to have technology with lower costs, they're driven to operate their technology at the lowest cost point. It's the same principle. And this point was actually discovered by Harrod when he abandoned his idea of imperfect competition and switched to a different notion, which was in the 1930s. Nobody remembers that, but Harrod worked on trade, on micro imperfect competition and monopoly power and all of that stuff. So that's the third po fourth point. And um, The fifth point is that, um, or what did I say, fifth point, yeah, uh, is that um, accumulation is a function of the rate of return minus interest. But in the case of Marx, it's not the level of investment, it's the growth rate, the growth rate of capital, which is investment divided by capital stock. Now you can think of this as a way of normalizing investment, that is when you, if investment is growing over time, then you have to treat it relative to something. You can treat it as relative to the capital stock or relative to output, but whatever you do, you recognize that investment goes up if, if uh, net profitability goes up faster. And again, this is not a difficult argument to make from the business literature, but it's surprisingly difficult to uh, make in the economics literature. Okay. Now let me get to the sum result of all of this. I made this point before, but this is a point worth emphasizing, that the point about capitalism is best understood by Keynes and Marx, of course, but Keynes especially. Uh, here says, the engine which drives enterprise is profit. Now, what does that mean? It means that firms make production plans with the anticipated profit in mind, profit on production. They don't do it because they feel good or look shiny or anything like that. They do it because they want to make profit. 
But when they deci decide to make profit, it means the planned production is based on expected profitability. Then also it means that they have to make decisions to hire workers. They have to make decisions to buy raw materials. They have the decision to fix or expand their plant and equipment. So therefore the demand for materials, the demand for consumption goods from workers, and the demand for investment goods, and then they also have to pay in order to run a business, prop, uh, rents and interest and dividends, which are property income. So that's a source of income for the demand for consumers, uh, for uh, consumption from property goods, from property income. So you have workers' consumption and capitalist consumption, you have raw materials demand, and you have investment demand coming from the same motive. That means that demand and supply are both regulated by profitability. It doesn't follow that they match for obvious reasons, because the, all of these are individual elements flying out of the decisions of individual firms, and they're different aspects of profitability. The production profitability is short term. You decide every uh, uh, month whether you're going to keep the sh shop going or whether you're going to close it down. Right? If you run a coffee shop, you decide, uh, do I get customers or not? If you're, on the other hand, making a decision to expand, then you're not concerned with what's going to happen next month. You're going to be concerned with what's happened over the next couple of years, because it costs money to set up a new coffee shop and all that, and you don't want that money to be wasted. So you may be looking five years ahead. You may be wrong. That's not the point. The point is, short-term look ahead for production, long-term look ahead for investment. And there's no reason why the sum of all these individual decisions made by firms and then the consumption decisions made by their workers and the consumption decisions made by their property owners and their own investment decisions, no reason why it should add up. In fact, one can say obviously they won't add up. You could do this yourself, by the way. You can use an agent-based simulation model and model this. And you'll see that the sum of these decisions will not add up. So therefore you need a rule which capitalism has, which is to bring them back into line. And that's a whole rule that we're going to talk about now, aggregate demand and supply and all of that. Uh, so I want to emphasize that whereas neoclassical economics says that uh, macroeconomics is supply side. That is to say, given the supply of labor, the system will move towards full employment output. How does it do that? If, for instance, the supply of labor, uh, if, the, if, for instance, the, the wage rate, I'm sorry, if, if, for instance, the supply of labor increases, then the wage rate will go down, and this will make it more profitable to expand production, and therefore you'll hire more workers, and the wage rate will go up to the level that creates full employment of labor, or go down to the level that creates full employment of labor. Vice versa, the labor supply shrinks. So if they have the argument that all labor is fully employed, automatically from the internal mechanism of the system, then you can say that the output of the system depends on the input, which is labor, plus technical change, which changes the relationship between the input and the output. So this is basically supply-side economics. This is what Bob Gordon does in his book on productivity growth. He measures productivity growth on the assumption that the determination of output is entirely from the inputs and technical change. And therefore, any changes that he sees must be due to those two factors, and productivity becomes the central thing. But Keynes, if Keynes was there, he'd be going, no, Professor Gordon, you're totally wrong, because in fact demand is the source of the growth of output. So Keynesians say out macroeconomics is demand side, it's driven by demand, uh, in the short run at least, and therefore employment depends on the level of demand, and uh, Output growth is therefore driven from the portions of demand that are autonomous, which is investment demand in, in Keynesian theory and maybe government spending and so on. So you have a different theory of demand. I'm arguing that, um, that neither one of these is correct because they misunderstand that both demand and supply are regulated by profitability. So you, it's not supply side economics, it's not profit, it's not demand side economics, is not Say's law, is not Keynes's law, but the law of profit, which is that both sides are regulated. And that's why profit plays this regulating role on both sides. Any questions here? <laughs>
I talked about the savings rates. So let me get down to showing you some the classical dynamic. Show you some pictures because it's in the book and. So let's go to the question. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so just to clarify the argument, but uh, okay, so in response to saying that um, what's the line on earth profit determined? Would argue that profit is determined by demand, but basically you're saying that like, uh, because of the originator savings, that's an incomplete argument? No, that's a good question. So let me clarify that. Keynesians say that the amount of profit is determined by demand. Right. I'm talking about the rate of profit. And that's Keynes' marginal efficiency of investment. And even they don't say that's determined by demand. Though in the short run, uh, uh, a demand stimulus may create animal spirits and all that. But as I said, the key point that Keynes fudges with his aphorism that in the long run we're all dead is exactly the point about what determines these factors. And it's a mistake to think of it as in the long run. Think of it as fast and slow. This is an important distinction. Fast and slow is like the difference between you're doing something now and the effects pile up over time. Like environmental degradation is slow. Environmental pollution is fast. We totally understand now that you can't simply say that because in the long run I'm dead, I don't need to worry about pollution, right? I don't need to worry about effects because these effects are uh, cumulative. And in many processes, engineering is a fast example, you have fast and slow processes. The thing about fast and slow is that they operate at the same time. They just operate at different speeds. And so you can say, well, I'm going to ignore the slow for the moment if it's slow enough. But you can't ignore the slow over time. That doesn't make any sense because yesterday's slow is today's uh, current effect. So you can't do that. So mathematically, you have to have both of them going at the same time. And that means, by the way, another type of mathematics. You need the mathematics that allows for different time speeds. And that's well known. In engineering it's known, in physics it's known, biology it's known, but in economics it's known. In economics we say short run, nothing changes with investment. Long run, demand and supply are equal and investment. Actually both are operating. You have to show how they operate. And you have to show how they influence each other, right? So let me give you the example in the, in the case of a shop. You, have, you run a coffee shop. Your coffee shop customers come in. If they come in a lot more today, you get excited, but you're not going to hire five more workers. I mean, that would be crazy. But if they start coming in every day or on a regular basis and you think, okay, this is actually a short run increase in demand that is a signal and I'm going to hire another worker. Now, if this happens over months or you think it's going to happen over months or years, then you think, well, okay, I need to expand my shop. Maybe I'll open another one nearby. That's an investment decision. And that's a slower reaction because you're going to look ahead more. The short run is a short look ahead because tomorrow may, may, may not come again. So that difference is not something that happens at a different time. They're both going on at the same time. It's how you read the signal. That's the important difference. Okay. So imagine now, I, I, I want to show you the results of a the equations that I describe in the book about uh, how these processes work. So imagine that you had uh, a growth path of output around some trend. This is what you would expect it to do. If there was no stimulus, nothing going on, output is fluctuating around the growth path in the sense that the profit rate and the interest rate have determined a particular growth path. And there are shocks and local fluctuations that cause you to move around that growth path, right? So we said the growth of output, growth of, of capital, rather, uh, growth of, let me back up a bit. This is what we're looking at. The growth of capacity and hence the growth of normal output is a function of uh, uh, this term, which is the profit rate minus the interest rate at normal levels, plus a series of other terms having to do with technical change and shocks. You can partition out the part because I want to focus on the effect on profitability, so I need to separate them out. In practice, of course, they're all 
uh, done together, but you can actually measure. We're going to look at the measurement to see how you can separate these parts out. So we're concerned with the growth of output depending on net profitability, depending on the change in the capital to output ratio at normal capacity, and shocks having to do with demand, supply, capacity utilization, and stimulus. Demand and supply fluctuate around each other, so zero mean. Capacity and output fluctuate over a longer time, so it's zero mean over a slower process. Not longer time in the sense of it happens in the future, it happens more slowly. Uh, and then you have uh, uh, the technical change element which I'm going to come to in a minute. So imagine that this output, this process of normal output is uh, given by two variables, the, uh, the normal share of investment and the output to capacity, the, the output to capacity ratio. Oh, I'm sorry, capacity to capital ratio. And if we had fluctuations around it, then we would expect all other things being equal, the, the path would look something like this. Because all those other terms, the demand, supply, capacity utilization, that's going to cause fluctuations around the output, on, on the equilibrium path, right? So that's the, the base expectation that you will see fluctuations around a path. But the path depends on net profitability. And this is very important. So now let's look to see what would happen if you have a stimulus. I'm sorry, if you have a drop in net profitability. Since the path depends on the normal profit rate minus the normal interest rate, if that goes down, then the center of gravity of the adjustment will itself be going down because this is the slope is dependent on that path, so on the normal net profit rate. So you would expect the fluctuations to adjust to a new path and so you'll get something like this rather than previously something like that. That's just uh, breaking down the results into the profitability effects and other effects, okay? But here, I'm simply saying that this profitability effect is independent of the other effects. But suppose you had a stimulus, a temporary stimulus. Well, a temporary stimulus, which doesn't change the normal profitability path, would raise the level, but not the rate of growth. That's an important thing about growth paths. In growth paths, the paths are parallel, they have the same growth rate, because this is a log scale. So if they're growing, they're growing at the same rate. But the level depends on a stimulus. So this is the truth of the Keynesian argument. If I have a stimulus, for whatever reason, without changing profitability, then that stimulus is going to cause me to rise to a new level, and the growth rate will be unchanged, because by assumption I haven't changed profitability. Everybody with me here? This is a difference of shifting from a level argument to a growth argument. And this is kind of neat because this allows you to see the truth of the Keynesian argument, which is that the level does change. And Keynes says, well, when I'm, the growth rate I'm taking to be done in the longer run, I'm leaving it unchanged. And this just follows, from, by the way, from a simple simulation. All these simulations are just the equations run in Excel or whatever. And you, they're in the, in the book webpage, which is called realecon.org. The data, the simulations, everything is there. So you can do these yourself too. But now, this is a temporary rise. So why temporary is that it causes a change in the level, and then you come back to the same uh, growth rate. Uh, but suppose that you have a stimulus which causes the system to rise to this new level, but that stimulus causes the share of wages to rise relative to output. Remember I, I, I argued last time that this is very central. If a stimulus pumps up the economy, doesn't affect profitability, then you don't have any problem. Other things being equal, you're on the same path of growth as before, but you're just on a higher level. But if the stimulus undermines profitability, if it runs into that, then what you're going to see is this Keynesian bump, 
What you won't see right away is that the now the system is fluctuating around a lower growth rate. So what you've done by the stimulus is you pumped up the level, but if you slow down the growth rate at some point you'll be fluctuating at a lower level than you would have otherwise. It doesn't follow it'll be lower than you started, but it could be lower than you started. It depends on other things that happen. If this is extended down, it sooner as later is going to cross the old path. That means at some point other things being equal are going to be fluctuating around either the same level or a lower level. So it's possible that a stimulus could lead to a decline in the rate of growth, which would cause employment to rise, unemployment to rise, and even a fall in the level of output uh, later. And that follows simply from the logic of the argument that growth depends on profitability and stimulus. And the stimulus raises the level, but insofar as it inhibits profitability, it can negate itself over a slower process. Now, if you don't look for this, what you're going to see, what you'll see is the stimulus has this boom, and then you go, for some unknown reason, it dies out. And this is important because in post-Keynesian economics, structuralist economics, profitability cannot be hurt by stimulus. Because profitability comes from the markup. And firms choose the markup they want, so why would they choose a lower profitability? That doesn't make any sense. So the profit rate can't fall. And so you get the idea that a stimulus is always good. But I argued in part earlier, one of the earlier lectures, that is historically, that is exactly what you don't see. The first great Keynesian stimulus was Hitler. And he had a tremendous, it wasn't him really, it was the finance minister Schacht, who had this tremendous boom caused by deficit spending and um, uh, purchasing power printing, and they went from massive unemployment to full employment within one year. Remarkable, nobody had ever done it before. The next one, big one that I focus on, there are others in Europe and all that, but the U.S. wasn't impacted by the war in the same way, so it's cleaner, so to speak, is the U.S. war effort. 1929, the economy falls into a deep hole. It sort of fluctuates around, it's not recovered yet, and by 1939, it's climbing back on, and the U.S. begins the post-war, uh, begins the war effort. It begins to repair, because Roosevelt already knew he was going to get into the war, but he waited until 41. So they begin to prepare, and in 1941, so already you can see this rise, and we know that because we know they began to prepare for armaments and all that. And you see the rise in employment and output, and then you see this big rise in World War II. And then, in spite of that, the rise is not negated. So hang on one second. So one of the two things that tie these two together, the fact that there is no negation, in other words, that it looks like the other one, it looks like this, is that they did not allow in either Hitler's Germany or US's war effort prices to rise. They had wage and price controls. And productivity, on the other hand, rose. So real wages didn't rise very much, or perhaps didn't rise at all. But, and the wage share fell because workers were told, this is, you have to fight. We're fighting for our country. You have to work yourself at physically as hard as you can, as long as you can. And so the war effort produces big increase in the length and intensity of the working day, hence in the productivity of labor. Uh, and manufacturers were encouraged to increase productivity in other ways, because it, after all, the nation was at risk. Same thing in Germany. And in both countries, the profit rate rose. And you can measure that. In the 1970s, it's a different situation. It's peacetime. Workers are not under any stricture. And so what happens in the 1970s? You pump up the economy, wage share starts to rise. I showed you that in the graphs before. In that, When the wage share starts to rise, the profit rate falls. We looked at that also before. Profit rate falls, you're now undermining the growth rate. Unemployment begins to rise. They think, oh, we didn't do enough stimulus, so bang, hit it again. So then you get another stimulus, and you get inflation. Well, in Phillips' curve tells us it's okay, well, a little bit more. Unemployment creeps up, so they hit it again. And what you get is unemployment rising, stagnation, and inflation, which is impossible in Keynesian theory, because inflation can only come when you have full employment. 
and here you have rising unemployment and you have inflation. Wiped out Keynesian economics in steps Friedman and Phelps and changes the whole history of economics from uh, beginning in the 1980s and with the Nobel Prize also which was invented by the Swedish Central Bank in order to support right-wing economics you get um, this change. By the way look at that the book I mentioned it before I think called the Nobel Factor which is a book about the history of the Nobel Prize written by a professor at Oxford a historian who got access to the archives of the Swedish Central Bank and the book is about how the Swedish Central Bank set out to change the way economics was uh, understood, move it towards what we would now call neoliberal economics, free market support because the Swedes and the Europeans and the Americans were saying following Keynes that you need to intervene to keep a capitalist economy going and they said no we will, free markets is the right way to go and so Friedman uh, Samuelson, Friedman, Solow, the whole gang, so to speak, Chicago, MIT, uh, came from uh, the Nobel Prize, came from the Swedish Central Bank. As you know, I'm sure you know, it's not a Nobel Prize. Yesterday, Krugman was talking about it. He called it the Swedish thingy, because as he said, it's a, it's a bank prize from Sweden, and it's not a Nobel Prize. So he called it the Swedish thingy. Well, the Swedish thingy was set into motion to change economics and it was extremely successful. Because now everybody thinks that the right point of view is the, are the people who gave the Nobel Prize, who got the Nobel Prize. And those, the politics of those people have changed a bit because times have changed. But the economics of those people hasn't changed because it's still based in neoclassical economics. Krugman said yesterday that he thinks now economics took a wrong turn 40 years ago. Well, 40 years ago was when the Nobel Prize started to push economics in that direction. And that's why he was calling it the Nobel thingy, I mean the Swedish thingy, because he's certainly aware that he's part of that turn. He's, he's very progressive, but he got the prize also because he used standard theory as the foundation for his argument. Joan Robinson didn't get it um, because she was too anti-neoclassical. I mean, she was openly anti-neoclassical. Kaldor didn't get it, Kahn didn't get it, uh, Galbraith didn't get it. I mean, the list is very long. Anyone who was critical of market capitalism didn't get it. And then later they began to have the people who are critical of the current form of market capitalism, but not one of them is critical of market capitalism. So the Nobel Prize has a function and a big effect. Okay, so my point here is that you can make sense of these historical phenomena. The last example I gave, which it's in this paper which I'm going to put on my home page now, uh, which is on the book web page. Mariam put it on, it's called uh, Conditions for Successful Stimulus or something like that. And the point is that if you get into the realm where the stimulus undermines profitability, then what you're doing is pumping up the level, but just slowing down the growth rate. And that means that you could end up with a lower output level and you certainly could end up with higher unemployment because the supply of labor is growing. So the unemployment rate could be higher. And that's exactly the problem you observe. Brazil had two governments, Lula governments, very progressive. They did wonderful things. But they discovered to their ch great chagrin and political detriment because they then lost power that uh, inflation began to go out of control and the growth rate slowed down. And if you look at their own estimates, profitability fell. So the private sector was in effect damaged by the uh, stimulus uh, because of the rise in the wage share. So this is not, this is a kind of uh, fiscal crowding out, but not due to the interest rate or anything like that. It's due to the fact that the wage share rising lowers profitability. Any questions about this? Um, I'm going to end there because I want to talk about the crisis. So I want to switch, but the crisis is going to be linked to this. The point of a crisis is how do you solve a crisis? And the answer on the right is austerity. Lower wages, increased productivity, lower costs. And the right answer on the left is stimulus. My point is that those two are not independent. They're linked. If you have the austerity first, you get uh, what Krugman was talking about correctly yesterday was that 
<coughs> you get much damage to the citizenry, standard living, poverty, uh, output and employment fall, but it does in fact lower wages, which is the point. If you get austerity, you prevent that from happening, but then either you pile up a huge deficit and debt, certainly if it's a foreign debt, you have to worry about that. If you don't have your own currency, you have to borrow from abroad, and that debt can undermine everything, and also the profitability falls. You lose competitiveness. It's not just profitability, but if your costs are high, unit labor costs are high, you, competitively you're behind. And this is the Greek story. So uh, we need to be aware that what we would like to see can be done, but you have to understand the limits of what we would like to see. I mean, and nobody would be surprised if I said, yesterday someone asked Krugman, what do you think about the $15? wage, and he said, you know, broadly, 15 is okay, but above that maybe, and he's right, nobody knows for sure, but it seems feasible. But what if someone had asked him, what do you think about the $50 wage, minimum wage? I think most people would recognize that that would have a negative impact, because on one hand, it would give poor people, uh, uh, people who have minimum wages, uh, a lot of money. On the other hand, it would mean that firms would have to pay $50 for the same worker they were paying 12 before and nobody believes that that would have no effect on employment. So yes, workers would have more wage per worker, but there may be a lot fewer workers who are employed. A Keynesian, strictly speaking, would have to argue that that has no negative impact. It would cause consumption demand to rise, because they don't make a link between consumption demand and the investment demand through the cost of wages and the effect on profitability. So I'm going to stop there because I want to get to the crisis. Yeah. general technical change will do it. What, what kind of, is that, is that right? And what else increases profit? No, I, didn't, I don't think I said that. Uh, you can pump up the economy. In the, so let's just go back a little bit. That's a good question. So if there was no stimulus, then the economy would be fluctuating around some path, dependent by dependent on net profitability. And it's not technical change. Technical change comes from the idea that you have a production function. So all of labor is fully employed. If there was no technical change, then output would be dependent on the input. But because you have productivity, the production function has a shift parameter, which is technical change or change parameter. So the amount of output you get from an amount of input changes over time, and that's technical change. In the original solo thing, it's A, which is the solo's original uh, neutral technical change is that output is a technical change parameter times uh, a function of capital and labor, right? These are time variables. But capital is built to accommodate the full employment of labor, so that's kind of endogenous and the production function allows you some flexibility in their use. So the key driver is the exogenous variable, so the capital is endogenous. But technical change is also endogenous. So, product, so basically, this relationship determines a certain amount of output per unit worker, and productivity change changes the output per unit worker through technical change. Right? So that's the idea that growth is driven by technical change. But I'm not making that argument. I'm making a different argument that growth is different by profitability, and profitability has impact on technical change. I mean, uh, technical change has impact on profitability, but that impact is not so simple, and that's what I want to come to next. Technical change can actually undermine profitability. That's the following rate of profit type of argument. So I'm going to come to that. Okay, any other questions here? Yeah. Uh, that would be the first one. Then, then whose model? The Goodwin. Goodwin model? Okay. Yeah. And, and the second one is, what is your position in regard to, you know, some alter uh, alternative theories that are explaining the, the business cycle by uh, relying on different underlying mechanisms, like uh, the Caldorian explanation of the business cycle, the Minskian. Um, okay. Kind of so, uh, uh, one thing at a time. So, Goodwin. 
Goodwin takes his argument from Marx. So the Goodwin model is a mathematical formalization of the argument about the reserve army of labor. So obviously, I, I didn't talk about that here, except to say that the key point of the reserve army of labor argument is that when you uh, tighten the labor pool, you narrow it, then capitalists have an incentive to bring in more workers and or displace them more rapidly through mechanization. So it's not like capital is not passive. And it's important that the technical change is always endogenous. It depends on the incentives that capitalists get, one of which is to cut costs, but they can also change the balance between capital and labor in this process. So Goodwin does talk about that, but not the model is a model of thing of great beauty, but it doesn't encompass these aspects. For instance, in the Goodwin model, which you will notice, and I discuss this in the book at some length, is that the wage share is given by the parameters of the model because technical change is taken to be given, the productivity growth. And so the, the constant rate of unemployment produced by that gives you a particular wage share. Now what does that tell you? It's really amazing. The model says that the workers have no say on the wage share. The same thing that, uh, that uh, many models do, that the wage share is a result of technology. In the case of the Goodwin, it's a result of keeping the labor supply and the labor demand equal, and there's a, the wage share does that adjusting, so therefore you can't have uh, a wage share which is uh, dependent on class struggle, for instance. And that's even more so in the long run, say, Harrod model, and I, I discuss this at length in the book. So one of the things is, what's wrong with that? And the wrong, in my opinion, the uh, part of it that's wrong is the idea that these parameters are sort of fixed, that is to say the labor pool won't change because capitalist technical change won't change in response to this. The capital labor ratio won't change. So I take the Goodwin model, I expand it to incorporate the kind of argument that he was supposed to be modifying, uh, representing, which is in Marx, and you see that it changes the story completely. So you are basically endogenizing the, the wage share um, to the size of the reserve power. Well, the wage share depends then on, on class struggle. I mean, that's a key point. And so that means that the wage share is historically determined. And given that, you have other factors that can uh, narrow or widen the reserve army of labor and affect the wage share from that too. And obviously these are, historically you compete on, on a particular ground. If there's low unemployment, then you have the advantage. If it's high unemployment, they have the advantage, right? So yeah, I develop a whole story of that. And the wage share curve, which I drew last time is about that issue. I mean, it's an actual empirical curve. I didn't draw the curve, I just traced the path of the economy. So, uh, and of course, Caldorian and other arguments are, are, are based on partial. I'm trying very hard to show that the same framework gives you answers to all their questions and gives you a different answer because they always leave out something. And this is not a new framework. You can be tracking it back to Smith and Ricardo and Marx. That's my main point. Uh, yeah. No. So what I see is that um, you are saying that the Keynesian multiplier, um, I mean the role of the Keynesian multiplier in explaining economic fluctuation is actually low. So um, if we don't have this interaction between the Keynesian multiplier and the investment accelerator, we, don't, we cannot have the kind of Cardorian cycle. Yeah, but it's not the accelerator because the accelerator is essentially a linear relationship that was comes out of these, and you can have a Caldorian accelerator that is nonlinear, but it's missing the point. For me, the connection is between the effective demand impulse, which is the pumping up purchasing power, and profitability. The relation between these two can be formulated in many linear, nonlinear ways, but that central relation tells you that when you run into the limits of profitability, uh, you get into trouble. Now, I, I formalize this in the book. I'm not just skipping that. But the main point is that any formalization has to be true to the underlying economic logic. Models are there because it's supposed to represent some underlying argument. And the Keynesian doesn't have that argument. And the reason, by the way, is that Keynes's argument, uh, the interest rate and the profit rate are exogenous. They're not linked back to the conditions of the wage share. Uh, you know, I haven't discussed here, but the Caldor Passanetti models were all attempts to solve a problem in Harrod, which was if the rate of growth of the out warranted path was determined by a parameter, then the unemployment rate could not be stable because that rate of growth could be faster than the rate of growth of labor supply, which you call the natural rate of growth, in which case 
uh, unemployment would fall progressively to zero, or it could be lower, in which case it would rise above. So then Caldor and Passanetti tried to figure out what's wrong with that, and ha Harrod took the savings rate as fixed. So they said, aha, the savings rate depends on the savings of workers and the savings of capitalists, so the, the wage share will make the savings rate adjust so that unemployment can be constant in the long run. But that then means the wage share is dependent entirely on accumulation and workers have no say whatsoever. And that's completely contrary to all historical evidence. So these are wonderful models. Uh, Passanetti was my teacher. I adore him and he's a brilliant man. But uh, I'm making an argument which is different. That if the wage share is primarily determined by class struggle and unemployment. And that's why the curve shifts when the class struggle shifts, by the way. And then from there, the theory has to be linked that to profitability, from that to growth. And so some of the mechanism looks the same, but it's a different story. Completely different story. And the thing is, I, I don't see these as model. Models are ways of exemplifying theory. And so the thing to keep in mind is the theory. What is the theory? A model is just a way of representing the theory. And we always know models are useful to, ex to bring up some aspects, but they're not complete. Nobody would say that. So keep your eye on the theory. How about the Mises the ah. Well, you're saying that investment is mostly financed uh, through retail, uh, that's retail right. earnings, so that's right. we cannot have the, uh, the sort of uh, financial side of that. Uh, that's right. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. So, but remember that these variables here, in the short run, depend on lots of other factors. I'm saying that they're linked in some fashion to the normal rates, but these other relationships is exactly where Minsky can enter as well as effects of interest rates and all of that. And so you need to have the Minsky side, but you need to link it. One of my students by the name of student Schroeder, who did a dissertation on the Asian crisis, showed that you can take the actual profit rate and the interest rate and show the point where the crisis becomes uh, un, uh, uh, risk and, and ca causes collapse when the profit rate hits the interest rate, which is what I'm coming to now. And that is a sort of Minskyan point. When you're not making enough money to pay the interest equivalent, you can think of that as a Minsky point. It's not strictly speaking, but it's close. The same idea, those two variables are playing here. So you could go back and see Minsky from a different point of view, which is not a short run point of view, but the short run fluctuations in the long run perspective, in a slow. I say long run, but I, I shouldn't be allowed to say that. It should be fast and slow. Okay, so now we've told that story, uh, let me close it, and I want to talk about the current crisis. Where did I put it? Oh, it's a PowerPoint. <laughs> Clever. Okay, I'll take that out. out. I don't need that anyway. Okay, what I want to do here is to, sh to try to explain the crisis on the basis of the same theory. So that I, I can't, I'm not free, so to speak, to invent a theory of crisis and one of trade and one of the stock market and one for aggregate demand because the fundamentals <laughs> there have to be shown to be acting in the same, uh, in, the, in different domains, but they are acting the same fundamentals. That's a key point of having a theoretical foundation. So, uh, and this is based on my book. As I said, you can go to realecon.org, and we have all the data and uh, reviews of the book and all kinds of things, and spaces for people who are working on these projects to share it with other people so that yeah. people know that you're working on them, and since other, more than one person may be working on the thing you're interested in, you, hopefully we can create some kind of community from that. And as I said, the point of the theory is that we're looking at actual capitalism, not economic theory. I am not interested in that sense, in what Caldor said, or what Goodwin said, or Minsky said. I'm interested in what the real phenomena, and then I look to see what they said to compare to the real phenomena. So this is not a history of thought. This is an analysis, of, a scientific analysis of capitalism. And they enter insofar as their explanation is 
uh, revealing of some basic things. Um, and what we're talking about now is um, chapter 16. I'm going to skip chapters, I won't get to chapter 17, but that's where extensions and applications of the work to many other domains, inequality, uh, the effect of the state, the welfare state on wages and, and uh, uh, incomes of workers and benefits, uh, and also the issue of development, which I, here I'm focused on the developed capitalist world. And I mentioned before why that is. When I went to graduate school at Columbia, they said, oh, where do you come from? Pakistan. Okay, so you must be interested in development. It was typecasting, yes, I know. And, uh, but the fact is, I was interested in development. So I started studying development. What do I see? They apply these neoclassical models of development. I'm going, this is junk. You can't be serious. No, this, you have to do that because we do the real theory and you just apply it. So I, 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 feel, I refused. And I've spent the rest of my life trying to work out a proper alternate foundation that covers the same bases, so to speak. And I urge you to think about that because we get trapped into thinking that all we are capable of doing is applying their foundation. But we're capable of creating a new foundation and creating a movement around a new foundation. It sounds like Bernie Sanders, I know, but I do believe that. So think of it that way. So I want to make the first point. The mortgage crisis is often said to be uh, caused by the, I'm sorry, the current crisis is often said to be caused by the mortgage crisis. And that, it seems to me, makes an elementary mistake, which is the difference between the trigger and the cause. Now, I'm of the age that when I say this, uh, it's meaningful. If you have a heart attack because you win the lottery, it's not the lottery that caused your heart attack. It's because you have a heart condition that triggered your heart attack. And it could be good news or bad news. You could have lost the lottery and it could cause a heart attack. So everybody understands this. And there was actually an article I saw in the New York Times, a man in Brooklyn who won the lottery and he got a heart attack. I don't think he got it from the lottery. He got it from the pressure of all his relatives who wanted him now to give him all the things they needed because he got a lot of money and it gave him a heart attack. But we know that's not the cause. That's just a trigger. So once you understand that, then you have to understand what caused the underlying buildup of the, uh, that led to the mortgage crisis. And we know there was a huge credit bubble, which I'm going to come back to, that was caused by other factors. And that happened to burst in Florida first or uh, before it spread to the world. But it would never have spread. It's not the first time Florida has a mortgage crisis or something. That spread because the rest of the world was also this huge bubble. And so we need to go back to say, where did the bubble come from? And when we do that, we go one step back because either we say, based on bad actors, Bernanke or whoever we want to blame, or some underlying fundamental. And I'm going to show you the fundamentals, make this story very straightforward. Uh, we say sometimes, well, this is because of deregulation. First of all, deregulation has been going on for some time. You know, Clinton signed in things that allow banks to escape the regulation that was set up in the Great Depression to protect banking systems. But who made Clinton sign it? The answer was the banks. The banks were giving a lot of money to congressmen as they do nowadays. It's no secret. You can buy a congressman pretty easily, and senators are more expensive, but you need to get their support. And they pushed this reason, uh, this idea of bank re regulation on the grounds that all these profits being made that we can't get into because you say we can't take risks. So we want to take the risk because we'll make the profit, and sure, they deregulate it, and bang, you let the banks go. So regulations have an important factor. They can slow down, inhibit, but what they slow down and inhibit is profitability. And the state is never independent of the interests of the, the driving force of the system, which is capital. So the state gives in and is persuaded by economists who say markets are fine. Efficient market hypothesis, rational expectations. We don't need all this stuff. You're just messing things up. The market can handle it. Market, so don't, the regulations, in fact, Friedman says the Great Depression was caused by the state. It was not capitalism. So all those regulations, meaningless, let it go. And they let it go. And we got what could have been entirely expected. 
So we come then to the question of why there is a big boom in the first place. Sometimes you say it's Greenspan's folly. Uh, and I'm going to argue, on the contrary, that what we got was a structural crisis. And moreover, it was absolutely on schedule. These structural crises run roughly 40, 50 years. Uh, these are called long waves, but they're part of the long wave cycle. Uh, and they're not new. And every time they occur, people say, ah, oh, it was done because of what's his name or what's that policy, and then they happen again, and there's another policy and another name attached to it, but they don't look at the one name which is central, which is capitalism itself. It's a process, it's a system, I mentioned this, demand and supply come from the same incentives, but from different aspects of profitability, and they don't necessarily meet. Their regulation is precisely through overshooting and undershooting, and that long undershooting and un uh, overshooting is very important. Uh, eco economic historians speak of the Great Depression of the 1840s, where two young men uh, uh, were trying to overthrow capitalism because of the misery caused by that, and they were Marx and Engels in the streets in Paris, Marx, Engels in Germany. Uh, 1880s, you have uh, Freud writing letters saying, I'm, I'm very worried about what's happening. I don't know, my family will have to be pulled into a war. We won't have any work. And so this is. 1930s, we know, Great Depression, mass unemployment, uh, left movements all over the world, uh, and then right-wing movements all over the world with Hitler and fascism in, in uh, Spain and Italy. 1970s, the great stagflation, inflation rising, Keynesians are in power, they're supposedly controlling the system, the system is getting out of control. Uh, and some of them were sharp collapses, 1840s and 1930s, off the cliff. Others were long, drawn-out periods. The 1870s was called the Long Depression, because it's 1873 to 1893 in Europe. 20 years, people were thinking capitalism is dead, because it's just in this de deep depression. But eventually it pulled out. 1970s, the state intervenes. The state is viewed as the cause of this because it's a welfare state, but it tries to prevent, as banks fail and unemployment comes, it tries to prevent that, and that leads exactly to stagflation. And I believe that we're simply in a Great Depression now. This is the first Great Depression of the 20th century, 21st century, and it's not new. They had one, they had them in the 19th century, they had them in the, eight, in the 20th century, and we've had the first one of the uh, 21st century. And if these patterns continue, then you should expect two in this century. So someday you may be giving a lecture at my age to people saying, ah, I saw these two, but I'm, this is a new one. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I'm wondering about how financial deregulation is associated with like, you know, profit relative of non-financial corporations. I'm coming to that. So please save that question, and I will try to explain uh -huh. how that happens. So we start from the same key thing. My point throughout is to show that these very simple propositions explain many different things. Effective demand, profit rate equalization, all of that, relative prices, stock market prices, but here we're looking at the aggregate. And we're saying that accumulation is driven by the net profit rate. And we're going to look at the data, we're going to look at this measure. The pr uh, profit rate is the rate of return on new investment, and the key point is that when the profit rate approaches the interest rate, then that's it telling you that the profit on new investment <coughs> is not any more than if you'd left it in the bank. And this is actually the formal argument that Marx makes, which he calls the point of absolute overaccumulation. He says the point where the mass of profit of enterprise, which is the profit rate minus the interest equivalent, is stagnant, means that you just added to capital, which is what investment means, and you didn't get any more profit. So that means that it was that capital is wasted. So what happens, he says, and begins a withdrawal of capital. But the withdrawal doesn't start with the newer investment, it starts with the older one. So you get a phase change in the behavior of the system. Marx calls it the point of absolute overaccumulation. Grossman, Hendrik Grossman makes a big thing of this in, the, uh, uh, in his argument. And this triggers a phase change in the behavior of the system, literally, mathematically, a phase change. And the long boom, turns into a long downturn. Uh, and of course, then you get all 
inherent problems become exposed. I love this quote from Warren Buffett, uh, which is that you only learn who's been swimming naked when the tide goes out. And this is the point when the tide goes out. And then suddenly all kinds of things begin to, you're going, they did that? I can't believe that. But things were, uh, so we're going to look at what they did, how they were when they were in the tide going out. So I'm going to show you the path of the general rate of profit, the path of the interest rate, the path of the rate of profit of enterprise, the difference of the two, the total amount of real profit, real wages, productivity, so on, and household debt and debt service burdens. So let's see what the, first of all, very important when you're looking at profitability to distinguish between actual profitability and um, actual profitability and normal profitability. So I want to show you how that can be done. The profit rate is profit over capital and you can break it down into profit over uh, output. These are a flow flow ratio so they fluctuate but not as much as stock flow ratios. Then you have output over capital, but we can break output that into output over normal output and uh, normal output over capital. So what are these variables? This is the profit share. Now strictly speaking you want to get the normal profit share and you could do that by taking some kind of HP trend of it to the center of gravity of the profit share because there are fluctuations here. Profit fluctuates more than output, so there's some fluctuation. But these are flow-flow ratios. They don't fluctuate that much. This is the rate of capacity utilization. And this is the normal, uh, oh, this is the, I'm sorry, capacity to capital ratio. Now, why is it distinction important? The profit share is what we normally talk about when we talk about the class struggle, right? It's a balance between the division of value added into wages and profit. This is Marx's uh, surplus value over value, uh, value added. So it's S over uh, V plus S, right? This is the fluctuations due to effective demand. This is going to cause up and down and it's going to, you pump up the economy and you get capacity utilization will rise but then businesses will put in more plant and equipment so capacity rises so the utilization comes down. So we expect this to have a slower, this is the slow adjustment process and we expect that to be immediately affected by large pumping but then disappear because capacity rises. Everybody understand that? So you're running a business and I throw some money at you, the first effect is your sales will go up. If the sales go up sufficiently, you put in other businesses. Your capacity goes up. You hire more, you get more machines or uh, more photocopies, machines if your business goes up, so your capacity goes up. And you keep doing this until your capacity can handle the business we're just throwing at you. So then capacity utilization comes down because initially you're using the same machines and working three shifts. You add more machines and more workers and you go back down to two shifts or one shift. Now if you're running a photocopy shop you don't run after uh, 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock depending on where you are but if you get a big jump you might work all night to get it finished but then as you add more machines and more people you bring your capacity utilization down. So it can be actually fairly fast. It doesn't require you know 10 years. It depends on the machine and the uh, same thing for a bakery, on the other hand for an oil refinery it's a different story, it takes much longer. So this has got its intrinsic dynamic and this I'm going to call UK, utilization of capital and this I'm going to call the maximum rate of profit, the normal maximum rate of profit which is the ratio of capacity to capital. Now in this formula that's the technical change part. This is Marx's uh, uh, ratio of living labor to dead capital. 
at normal capacity utilization because we want to distinguish between the technological part which is this and the utilization of the technology which is this. Again, from the business point of view this is trivial and obvious, but in economics we often forget these distinctions. So we have three variables, profit share, capacity utilization, and the normal rate of profit. The normal uh, maximum rate of profit. Sraffa calls this a maximum rate of profit because if all value added went to profit, it would be this number. Of course it doesn't all go, only small, some of it goes, but it's the upper limit and it's determined by the technology and that's a nice, the beauty of it and the length and intensity of the working day. Okay? So one is determined by conditions of production, the other is determined by conditions of utilization and the third is the class struggle. So it's a nice separation and it's a familiar one if you think about it when we talk about any of this literature. So, then the question arises, how do you measure capacity utilization? Well, there used to be measures. There used to be a measure of uh, capacity utilization which was based on the utilization of electric motors in manufacturing. Why? Because electric motors are installed with a capacity. That's a maximum that they can, uh, engineering capacity. So you could see how much they were uh, being used because they would have to report the horsepower of the actual usage of the motor. So you had a wonderful built-in capacity utilization measure. This was discovered by Murray Foss uh, subsequently at the American Enterprise Institute. It was a great measure because it was directly observing the utilization of the capital stock which was all driven by electric motors. Unfortunately, the Bureau, uh, uh, the Surrey of Current Business and Bureau of Economic Analysis stopped asking the question. So you had this wonderful data going up to a certain point and then disappeared. Then I discovered another data source which was asking people, uh, businesses, how do you use your capacity? And that survey method. So this, this was survey of the actual utilization but the other was just verbally. And by going through and reading how it was constructed, I showed that you could duplicate the FOSS data with the survey data. And that was done by McGraw-Hill. And then McGraw-Hill stopped asking the question, so that data disappeared. So then I was left with the problem, the data disappears in the 80s, I'm working on this book in 2012, and I began to think about how to think of this problem. So here's what I came up with. Um, let me see, yes. Um, the ratio of output to capital, which is this part here, can be written as the ratio of output to capacity and uh, normal uh, and capacity to capital. This is just an identity, right? So this is just an identity. Now, uh, if I take the logs of these, and bring the capital stock, uh, actually, yeah, you, and bring the capital stock over to the other side, then you get uh, the log of capacity utilization plus the log of capital, which is here, plus the log of the ma maximum rate of profit. Now we have data on the capital stock. We have data on the output, so this is called an unobserved components model in econometrics and if you have a hypothesis about this, you can estimate this. Now this is a variable of technical change. You know, it's a slow movement to accretion of technical change in individual firms, so it's not implausible to say that this is a function of time. Now we try different functions of time, but a linear function works really well. So this is basically a technical progress function in the sense of Caldor. It's about the uh, uh, capacity capital ratio. So if you do that, then you can run this regression. Because then capacity is that part that is linked to capital stock. And if you run the regression, uh, and you make the assumption that over the long run capacity is 
approximately one over the slow process. You can run the regression. I, I talk about it in the book at length. And you get, effectively, you're asking capacity is that portion of output which is co-integrated with capital stock subject to a trend, time trend, unspecified time trend, an estimated time trend. And the estimates uh, will give you then the direction of this. So when you do that, you get a capacity utilization measure which looks like this. And I tested it against the data that I already had for, in, for um, uh, electric motors and survey methods. So when I did it for manufacturing, it gave a very close result for actual manufacturing. Now this is the economy as a whole. And you see here the Vietnam War boom. Beginning in 1960, because there are normal fluctuations, so it begins a little bit before, but this is going down, it comes back up, and here's the boom. To the peak of the war, 66, and then capacity utilization comes back down. And it comes back down because first the boom is this huge expenditure of deficit finance expenditure, and businesses are thriving, but then they're adding to their capacity. So the utilization rate comes down. So they bring it back actually to a normal utilization rate. And then you get another boom in the Reagan era, which is again deficit finance. Reagan was the biggest deficit of all. And you get this boom and then it comes back down. So it, you can see that there is a sort of normal a tendency, a central tendency of around 0.9%, 90% rather, utilization rate in this data. And you get these long booms, long waves. And these long waves make great sense when you look at the business literature about what's happening. But the other data is data from the Federal Reserve. And you see the Federal Reserve data it just has these small fluctuations. Why? Federal Reserve is based on a production function. Production function has no room for effective demand. So they estimate a production function on the assumption that all labor is effectively fully employed just some unemployment rate changes. So of course they define potential output from the production function. And this is important because theory determines your facts and you have to understand that. The facts are always based on the underlying theory. Measurement of the capital stock, measurement of profit, unemployment, capacity utilization. And that doesn't mean it's wrong for your theory, but if your theory is different, it's your responsibility to make sure the facts are consistent with the categories that you want and the understanding you want. Okay, is that point clear? So I have now a measure of capacity utilization, which anybody can do, by the way. All you need is real output and real capital stock. And you can create such measure. So here is the estimated normal capacity uh, capital stock ratio. The ratio of dead to living labor in the sense of Marx, or the maximum rate of profit in the sense of Straffa for the whole post-war period, and you see that it moves in a pretty steady way downward. This is a rising organic composition of capital in the sense of Marx. And it comes, it's steady because it's a million little firms all making individual local decisions. So there's no, you know, grand uh, ec story of this. It comes, technical change, this is technical change, comes slowly, and steadily. Of course there are little fluctuations and all that, but it comes fairly steadily. Now, the profit to wage ratio, this is what the rate of surplus value, it's the equivalent of the rate of surplus value. You can see in the post-war period, in the golden age of labor from 1947 to, to about 1980, the profit wage ratio is falling. The rate of exploitation is falling in the sense of Marx, right? And we know why that is. It's no secret. Many people have mentioned unions are strong. Welfare state is making sure that uh, unemployment doesn't get too low. It's making sure that if you are unemployed, you have uh, uh, payments that will keep you unemployment insurance and welfare payments that keep you from suffering too much. So that gives you power in the bargaining, right? So Friedman is right. This is where the state intervenes to help labor. And this causes the profit wage ratio, or the rate of surplus value, to fall. And then the profit rate in that period is falling also. This is a profit rate adjusted for capacity utilization. It's not a smooth rate because I don't adjust the 
the profit wage ratio. I could, I could smooth it also, but I chose not to do that. So this is the normal capacity profit rate. This is the profit rate that Marx is talking about, or Smith is talking about. Not the fluctuations, but the central tendency from the, the essential movements of technical change and structural. This is the structural element as opposed to the capacity utilization conjunctural element. If everybody understand that? So we see here a falling rate of profit very steadily in uh, uh, a falling rate of surplus value, a falling profit share, and a steadily falling ratio of uh, the maximum profit rate or the debt to living labor equivalent here. But notice what happens here. This is the period where uh, Reagan uh, and Thatcher in England smash unions, cut back on the welfare state, and literally weaken workers. I showed you before, the wage share curve shifts down in this period. Workers are weakened at any unemployment rate. They have less power to, to have uh, wage increases. And you get the wage share, the profit share then becomes a rising one. Reagan restored the profitability of capital. This is the age of capital. If this is the golden age of labor, this is the golden age of capital neoliberalism. And what it does is it stabilizes the profit rate. It doesn't make the profit rate rise. It eliminates the steady downward movement of a falling rate of profit. It reverses it because, of course, the, rate, the profit share is a socially determined variable. It depends on the balance of power between capital and labor. That's not a new argument. But the data makes that pretty clear, and you can see that. So you get these three, this is the Marx bias technical change, which the data f finds. This is the profit share, uh, profit wage ratio, which we see clearly goes up. And this is a profit rate that gets stabilized because the profit wage ratio is going up, but the maximum profit rate is going down. So the actual profit rate is roughly stabilized, the normal profit rate. Yes? Uh, so this Marx bias technology Um, I don't remember at this level of detail, but I think they don't adjust for capacity utilization, if I remember correctly. And for this is very important for me, because if you're talking about the Vietnam War boom, and you forget that, then you think that they have, there's just a flat profit rate and then it falls. And this is something I've done, I've mentioned to lots of people. I think Lee Punker is another person who, who measures profitability, doesn't adjust for capacity utilization. And I don't understand why not. Um, admittedly, you need data for it, but I have a technique for doing that. But people just take it for granted that the profit rate has what it is, is what it is. But that means that you don't believe in effective demand, because the whole point of effective demand is to raise capacity utilization. That's the point. Stimulate the economy. Um, so, I, I, uh, let me just move on, because I don't want to run out of time here. So this is the profit rate now without capacity utilization adjustment. This is the observed profit rate. And you see what happens? If you don't adjust for it, then you say, well, it went down, then it went up, then it went down. Well, yes, that's quite true, but it went up because of an intervention by the state to cause the capacity utilization rate to rise. The trend was actually falling throughout, but the state had a big impact on the level. But that same capacity utilization impact is not permanent because if you cause capacity utilization to rise, firms increase capacity and they bring it down. That's their job. So they, in fact, bring it down to the trend. The trend dominates in the slower process. Not the longer run when we're all dead, but a slower process. And this is not that long, by the way. We saw that before. You see these trends are, uh, what, 50, 60, let's say, 59 to 69, so 10 years, 12 years, whatever. Okay? Everybody with me here? Now, here is the actual profit rate, but this is the profit rate that would have happened if Reagan had not successfully shift the balance of power between capital and labor. I mean, he didn't do it himself. They did it, but he represented them. And so this is what the profit rate would have been like if the profit uh, share had continued to fall. And this is what it was. So they actually effectively stabilized profitability. So when you talk about that period, 
astonishes me that people don't talk about the key variable, which is profitability. That's what they care about, and they're clear about this. Pre-tax. Post-tax is what Trump is going to do. That's the other story. Now here's the other part of the story. I said that the rate of accumulation depends crucially on the rate of growth of normal output depends crucially on um, um, the normal, well let me just do output, on the profit rate minus the interest rate plus all these other fluctuations, right? And we've talked about the profit rate so far. Normal profit rate, capacity utilization, so on. But now, the interest rate. Because obviously, causing the profit rate to stabilize will prevent the falling profit rate, but it doesn't cause a boom. But lowering the interest rate now, that's something that capitalism has never done on a scale like this. So this is the history of the interest rate. Here's the interest rate, and you notice the, as the price level goes up, the interest rate goes up, which is one of the expectations that I have from the argument that the interest rate is determined by competition. And that goes up until you get this period here, which is called the so-called Volcker shock. Volcker was given, inflation is going out of control here, and Volcker was given the authority to go ahead as head of the Federal Reserve to shock the economy. And the way the Federal Reserve has a shock on the economy is to raise interest rates, because that uh, causes uh, investment to fall for just that reason. And, uh, makes credit fall because people can't borrow at these high interest rates, so the demand falls from the investment side, consumer spending, consumer borrowing side, and the Volcker shock, but the Volcker shock only takes it up to here. And many Keynesians say, oh, everything was changed because Volcker did it all. Absolutely false. The interest rate was rising long before Volcker, which they forget because the price level was rising. Volcker caused an acceleration to the rise, but then after Volcker, the interest rate was lowered down to, in this graph, uh, this is 2007, 2008, um, but it went to almost uh, one, zero percent afterwards. Okay, so this was another policy thing that makes perfect sense for restoring accumulation and restoring the balance of power. You weaken labor and you raise profitability, that's the austerity part, and you lower interest rates to stimulate the economy. What do you mean by that? You restore profitability doubly, because the other side of profitability, the negative part of it, is lowered, and so therefore you have a higher net rate of return. So, I don't know whether it is true that these folks read uh, Keynes or Marx, but they certainly act as if they did because they understand the real process. And that's not surprising. Keynes and Marx are talking about actual capitalism, not an ideal uh, DSGE model or RBC model or anything like that. They're talking about matters to capitalism, and this is what matters. It's fundamental. So this is the profit rate of enterprise. This is the rate of profit minus the interest rate. So this thing here, R minus I. And you can see how uh, it and I haven't adjusted for capacity utilization, so here's the boom, Vietnam War boom. It is a crisis period of the stagflation crisis, and you see what happens. It becomes essentially negative at the end of that crisis, and this is a very serious crisis, banking failures, business failures. People were worried that this was a Great Depression. The state had to step in to protect banks, protect businesses, just as it did in 2008. And then you get the recovery, where the profit rate is stable, but the interest rate is lowering, so the net profit rate is rising sharply, beginning in the Reagan years. And that was the cause of the rise in employment and growth in that period. And one thing we know, the growth rate rose, unemployment rate fell, workers were persuaded that this Reagan had actually saved them, and he did save them. He saved them by reducing unemployment and giving them jobs at lower wages. But look, if you're unemployed, the higher wage doesn't do you any good. Right? So that's an important f factor. And then, of course, we get the crisis again, 2008. 
And that comes, and that's what I want to talk about, comes from some of the consequences of this. This is another way of looking at the wage share thing. Here is the hourly productivity is the dark line. And the uh, lighter line is the wage. And you see that the two move together in some rough correspondence, but the wage is moving, rising more slowly than productivity. So even here, uh, uh, at least in this period, they're moving together and then more slowly. And the, but here you see the wage falling much more slowly than productivity, much more slowly. And this is the effect of attacking unions and, and attacking the welfare state. It slowed down the growth of, of wages. Didn't prevent it from rising, slowed it down. So here's another look at the data uh, from a different point of view, which is income of, by distribution in this period. Here you have an income distribution in the top and the bottom parts. The bottom 90%, uh, which is a green line, and the top 1% are growing at not roughly the same rate, but pretty close to each other. In fact, the bottom is growing a little bit faster in some period, right? Then comes the Reagan era. The top goes like this, and the bottom 90% as income, which is essentially stagnant, 90%. And that's the period of the great uh, stagnation of incomes of workers. Uh, yeah. Don't you need to question competitive Could you? That's not what we were looking at. Yes, OK. I, I thought I said that, but let me go back. This is the competitive interest rate. And this is when Volcker intervenes to move it away from that. Because the competitive rate, as you see, is moving up with inflation. Then Volcker moves to raise it higher than that, which he can do by putting brakes on credit and usual things that central banks can do. And then after that, they changed entirely to move it away from its competitive level, which would have followed up here, down to here. So that's the great intervention of central bank policy in the post-war period. And by the way, did it in all countries of the world. Everybody began to do the thing. This was to stimulate capitalism in a period where before it had become stagnant, and this was supposed to give it the stimulus. It doesn't follow that it always was effective in restoring growth, but uh, yeah. Do you have a separate uh, graph of uh, profit of enterprises where you adjust the profit by actual profit rate by capacity utilization? No, I don't, but you, I, I do, but you didn't show it in the book. I mean, when I hit a thousand pages in the book, something had to go, and a lot of things went. These graphs are among them, but uh, you can create it from the data. It's there, so it's in the book. Yeah, um, I guess this was also uh, appreciated by a uh, samurai from Yale Management School. He was he wrote a very short paper where he was looking at the real cause of uh, what he calls uh, financial crisis. He says this is modern background, like mutual funds, so, so, uh, hedge funds. Uh, Hedge funds and mutual funds actually, they just uh, took their money out of, out of the market. And that left the investment banks uh, in red, right? Um, but he also talks about some, something you actually mentioned. He actually says, uh, I guess during the 70s, 80s, he was saying that uh, because of this entrance of mutual funds, hedge funds to the money market, uh, banks, the existing banks became less competitive and they started ways of uh, uh, starting other ways of doing business. Uh, how does that fit? Uh, um, how? I, I don't address that here because my purpose is to show the broad movements, not necessarily to, uh, to trace every step in the movement. But the key point is here, this movement in the interest rate may well have local determinants of the sort you're talking about. But we know that the state was very much involved. I, I don't explain the fluctuations and all that. You can do that. But keep in mind this problem I always say. People look locally at things and they attribute all the determination to the local one, whatever it is. These guys were bad guys. These guys are good guys and because they have no other theory. So it's not obvious that that determination is central. It's always around a moving 
Here you can see this very clearly. It is central because, I mean, there are lots of local fluctuations that may be explained by other concrete factors, including business cycles and all that, uh, and foreign events. But this movement in every capitalist country in the world, I think, can only be explained by central bank policy. And the central banks say that's what they were doing. So in that sense, they were really pushing the interest rate down. And the other parts are reactions and adjustments and maybe some autonomous ones, but I don't think they're decisive. And many times when people always say, well, this is a local thing. You know, these bad guys in Florida and if what was that, the world would be fine. It's just not true. I, I want to make sure I don't run out of time, so let me. Here's a very interesting thing. Remember I showed you in the beginning that uh, if you look at prices over the long run, you see that beginning in 1790, they go way, way, way up and down a little. And by 1940, which is a long way from 1790, the price level is no higher than it was in 1790. Just astonishing. Then after 1940, the price level goes out of sight. Well, one of the things that happens after 1940 is precisely the amount of new purchasing power which is pumped into an economy with fiat money. You can do it with fiat money because you can print it. And fiat money is like Bitcoin, only you can create it as you want. So it's, it's a double thing, you know. You can, and basically the state is able to do that. Uh, private credit also gets, because the state is able to support the expansion of private credit. So this is a measure of the total amount of private and state bank credit, not debt, credit per employee. So credit is new in every period. And this is astonishing. This is credit in every period per employee. And if you want to look in one place first as to why inflation is what it is, it's this. It's the increase of purchasing power per person. Okay? In my chapter on inflation, I build this data into a more, uh, somewhat more general model, but it's very important. So here's something we know. Look what happens in the crisis in the, in the uh, 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 neoliberal era, 1930s. These are the wages of people working in the credit sector. These are the wages of people working in the insurance sector. These are the wages of people working in other finance, basically investment banking. And you see the wages are moving roughly together. In fact, the investment banking finance sector wages are, are lower than the wages in insurance and, and banking. Uh, but then in this period of the 1980s, you see this is where the bonuses and all the huge pumping up of the credit of the stock market and the, and the uh, uh, derivatives and all that. And you look at the difference in the income. This is financialization right here, expressed in terms of the wages of people who work in those sectors as opposed to the profits of that sector. OK. I've done this already. So. There are many other things I could do, but I want to make sure that I try to explain again what the purpose of this exercise is. The purpose is to show that the same framework that can explain um, growth can explain crises, uh, not independently of what happened socially and historically. The drop in the interest rate is, is institutional. The class struggle is intrinsically institutional, so that's always there, always. But they operate through some particular deep variables. And we have to understand the deep variables. Effective demand, equalization of profit rates, the movement to the stock market. I haven't even talked about the bond market. I mentioned the interest rate only, but I have a lot of data on that in the book. Um, uh, and I haven't mentioned at all exchange rates. So let me just briefly say, if you think what an exchange rate is, an exchange rate is the ratio of one currency to another, right? So the exchange rate is, let's say, E is uh, yen per dollar. That's an exchange rate. And we need a theory of the exchange rate. And I want to argue in the book that the same principle operates to determine the theory of, of ex interest rates, because if you take a real exchange rate, that's the price of uh, US goods times the exchange rate over the price of Japanese goods. 
or J for Japanese. So US goods are in dollars. And this is yen per dollar. And this is yen. So this exchange rate is now has no units. That's a real exchange rate. But if you think about it, what is a real exchange rate? It is really a relative price in common currency. When I look at the price of corn and steel in the United States, I take them in dollars to dollars. That's a relative price in common currency. But if I look at the price of steel in the United States and steel in, the, in Japan, then I have to use the exchange rate to make them common currency, right? So a real exchange rate is actually a relative price of two different goods. The goods in the basket of the US price index and the good in the basket of the Japanese price index. And what I show is that the real exchange rate is determined by real uh, costs of production of these goods. I mean, you can write that out. Um, um, I don't know how to do this without making it more complicated. But let me not say that. So these are prices of goods. And prices of goods depend on their cost structure and the profitability. So we can look at these, and I show that you can translate this into a statement about the determinants of the real exchange rate in terms of productivity change, wages, uh, real determinants, and that this explains the actual movements of real exchange rates in the US and Japan, for instance, in many different countries. I, that's an illustration, but in many different countries. Because they are relative prices, and relative prices are determined by relative costs of production, and um, uh, profitability, wages, and so on, that enters into the cost, and the equalization of profit rates, the relative prices of production. That's when we look at it. Now, when you do that, and it requires some development, what you find is that you find you're in the same domain as relative prices within a country, allowing for the exchange rate. And you can show the movements of the real exchange rate over time are regulated by the underlying real costs the cost of production in, in the US and Japan, let's say. Uh, and in fact, since we don't have data on that, I actually use uh, real wages and productivity, real unit labor costs. And even that works extremely well. So I can explain movements of the exchange rate. That has an implication, which is that exchange rates are not determined, real exchange rates are not determined by policy. They're determined by competitiveness. And that means that when I look at countries that are more competitive, they have lower unit labor costs or higher productivity, I would expect them to have a high, better balance of trade because people are going to buy from them, they're cheaper uh, in real terms. Uh, and so China, and before that uh, Korea, and before that Japan, and before that Germany, had balance of trade surpluses because they were more competitive. But if you're a neoclassical economist, like Krugman, then you would have to say that China and Japan and Germany were cheating. They were lowering their, their exchange rate uh, in some false way because neoclassical theory says that if you let countries compete who are unequal, the real exchange rate will move to make their cost structure the same. That's called comparative cost, the comparative cost hypothesis. So, Krugman is absolutely consistent to say, look, I accept the fundamental neoclassical theory, and since the US doesn't have, the US has a balance of trade deficit, it, we're not doing it, we wouldn't do that, so therefore it's got to be the other guy. And that follows logically. Estimates of the uh, equilibrium exchange rate are based on the assumption that the exchange rate would be such that the trade would be balanced. So if this trade is imbalanced, they say, you have a disequilibrium exchange rate. But from my point of view, this is an equilibrium exchange rate when the ex real exchange rate is determined by costs. And I expect to see persistent differences in trade balances, and I show in the book that they are persistent. They're persistent over the whole period for which we have data. And they're related to cost. So China wins because its costs are lower. Bangladesh wins its costs are lower. Or, uh, Japan, and before that Germany, and Korea. And these are due to the same principles that you have within a country. If the costs are lower in New Jersey, then I buy from New Jersey. So New York runs a trade deficit because I have more goods from New Jersey than I buy in New York, and New York costs are higher. 
adjusting for transportation and taxes. Now you can protect New York, you can have tariffs, you can prevent me from going across the border uh, in, in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, New Hampshire has next door to Massachusetts. New Hampshire has liquor stores which are run by the state, so liquor is really cheap. So people go across the border, fill up their car and come across and then Massachusetts started complaining and saying that's not fair. Uh, New Hampshire saying, well, it's competition. I mean, we're, we're allowed to, if it's cheap, it's pri we're not private, so we don't have to pump up the price. So then um, Massachusetts started putting people on the border to prevent you from smuggling goods back, even though in the United States you're legally allowed to bring goods across the border. And they were starting charging you tariffs and all that, and a little war took place in there. But that's the balance of trade issue. It's cheaper in New Hampshire, so of course you're going to buy in New Hampshire if you can, if the costs are not too great. And that allows us to unify the theory of international trade, the theory of national competition, exchange rates, interest rates, stock market, effective demand in the same framework. Now it's not a simple thing. You don't just say profitability and it just falls into place. You have to be concrete. You have to develop the actual mechanism. So I urge you to think about this as a way to do your own work, not just to say that was interesting, now let me go back to uh, uh, microeconomics or you know, uh, agent base, no, um, um, uh, go back to a DSG model. Yeah, you should learn how to do that, but if you're going to think about how to analyze the world, then consider that there's another way, not just neoclassical, not just post-Keynesian, which is also general, but a classical Keynesian framework. So, thank you.